This is the 2020 Porsche Taycan, and it is the most important car of the year. That's because it's the first electric car to generate as much hype and excitement as Tesla, which has dominated the electric car market for years. Today, I'm going to review the Taycan. I'm going to show you all of its quirks and features, and I'm going to find out if the hype is justified. First, a quick overview. Now, Tesla launched the Model S back in 2012 and quickly became an overnight sensation. Suddenly, everybody who got the newest high-tech smartphone and laptop wanted the newest high-tech car. Over the years, other electric cars have come out, but Tesla fans have barely even noticed the arrival of the Audi e-tron or the Jaguar I-Pace. They just don't bring as much excitement and hype as Tesla commands. And then the Taycan. Porsche first announced the Taycan as a concept car called the Mission E back in 2015. There was a lot of interest in the car then, but when Porsche announced it was going into production, it was a mad rush to Porsche dealers to place orders. Suddenly, there was a new electric car that everyone was interested in. The design of the production Taycan is remarkably similar to that Mission E concept, and right now you can get the Taycan in four versions. It starts with the 4S, which has 520 horsepower. Then there's the 4S with a battery upgrade and 560 horsepower. Then there's the Turbo with 670 horsepower. And then there's this, the king of the hill, the Taycan Turbo S with 750 horsepower. This car also has 775 pound-feet of torque, and it'll do 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. Of course, all this comes at a price, a hefty one. The base level Taycan 4S starts around $105,000 with about 250 miles of range. The Taycan Turbo S starts around $185,000 with similar range. Now, the other Taycan models offer more range, but it never really gets up there. It doesn't cross 300 miles, which means it doesn't get close to Tesla. The long-range Model S currently offers about 370 miles between charges. But there's more to this car than numbers. So today, I'm going to review the Taycan, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of the most hotly anticipated car of the year. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Taycan, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Taycan with simply getting inside. Now, when you walk up to the car, you can see the door handles are kind of pushed in flat against the door, so you can't really get your hand in there and open them up. So how do you do it? Well, it turns out if you have the key in your pocket, you walk up, stick your hand underneath the door handle, they pop right open, and then you can open the door right up. Take a closer look. You can see I walk up to the car, door handles flat, stick my fingers underneath, and then it opens up and you can open the door in basically one motion. It's pretty cool. Now, when your door handles are up like this, that basically serves as an indication that your Taycan is unlocked. If you want to lock it, just walk up to the door handle, tap it, and then it pushes back down into the door. The car is locked and you can walk away. Of course, you can also use your key fob to lock and unlock the doors. As you can see, pretty standard looking Porsche key fob. You press unlock, the doors unlock. You press lock, they lock. The thing I like about the key fob though is there's a little light around the Porsche crest at the base of the key fob, and every time you press a button, it kind of blinks to confirm that it got whatever button that you pressed, which is kind of a neat little look. But when it comes to opening stuff in the Taycan, the door is nowhere near the coolest item. That honor goes to the charge port. The charge port is right here, and you're thinking, all right, how do you open it? Do you push on it? Does it slide open? No. It turns out this little black piece protruding next to the charge port is a sensor. You slide your hand underneath the sensor and the charge port 
pops open and goes into the fender instead of just swinging open and looking ugly like a fuel door or the charge port in most cars. You want the charge port to close, same process the other direction. Just slide your fingers back under the little black sensor and the charge port door closes right up. This operation is by far the slickest of any charge port door I've seen in any electric car. And next up, moving on to the interior of the Taycan. There is a lot here, so I'm going to walk you through all of the interesting quirks and features. Now, when you get into this car, if you want to start it, just like all Porsches, you can do that to the left of the steering wheel. Porsche has some racing history around putting the starter to the left of the wheel, and that continues in to the futuristic electric car age. In this car, though, it's a button, like an on-off computer button. That's how you start this thing. We're certainly in a brave new world compared to an old school key you turn at the start of the Le Mans car race. But maybe the more interesting item in terms of getting in the car and driving off is the gear lever, which is to the right of the steering wheel. You can see it's this very tiny little lever that you can use to move between reverse, neutral, and drive. You go up for reverse, down for drive. Neutral is in the middle, and then park is a button off to the side. Now, I recently reviewed the new Porsche 911. It has this very same weird tiny gear lever, but it's mounted in the middle. In this car, it's over to the right of the steering wheel near the windshield wiper stock. Very unusual, but this is a futuristic, different kind of Porsche. So you might be thinking, okay, they've moved the gear lever up there. What was so important that they wanted to stick in the middle of this interior? And the answer is cup holders. You have one cup holder in the center, and then you have a second cup holder that's kind of off to the right, and that's what you have in the middle. You also have a little center console storage area. You press this button on the driver's side, it pops open, and then you can put stuff in there. There's also a wireless charging pad in there. Pretty simple stuff. That's the center of the Taycan. Now, the other item you have in the center of this car, far more important than the cup holders in the storage area, is this center screen. This screen has some of your more basic, more frequently used vehicle commands. You can see at the top, you have your climate control. You can adjust the temperature, the fan speed, the heated and cooled seats. Unfortunately, this screen is not just a simple little touch like Tesla and other automakers. You have to tap it pretty hard and kind of get feedback from the screen. It moves down as you press it, and that's how you know you've tapped something. Not exactly my favorite type of screen, but it's what they went with here. Now, to me, the bottom half of this screen is more interesting than the top half, even though it might look kind of blank. To start, you have a little button over to the side that has a battery and a car on it. If you press the battery part of that button. It tells you what percentage charge you're at and your current range, so you can always know by tapping that little button. If you press the car side of that button, a little car graphic pops up, and then you can use it to start opening stuff. If you press over here, for instance, you can open up the AC charger. There is an AC-DC charger over on the other side. You press that and it pops open the same way as the one I just showed you. You can also use the screen to open the front trunk. Press this little button and the front trunk will pop open. Then you can go around and put stuff in it. And you can use the screen to open up the rear trunk. You press the button and the rear trunk will pop open automatically. It's power operated. The cool thing here is you can also use the screen to close the rear trunk. You press this button on the screen and then the rear trunk will automatically close just like it opened so you don't have to get out of the car to do that stuff. Same deal with the charge doors. They will also open and close on this screen so the screen can be used to open and close stuff. Now, I will say there is one massive mistake in this screen, and that would be the volume situation. Several other automakers have learned, but Porsche apparently hasn't yet. The volume control in this car is on the touchscreen. You have to tap, 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 tap to increase the volume, tap, 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 tap to decrease instead of a simple knob. This is a mistake. It should always just be a knob, and there is one on the steering wheel, but if the passenger wants to change the volume, they have to start tapping. Bad design, and I hope they change change that. Now, next up with this center screen, you might be wondering, what is all the rest of this space for? There's so much empty space in this thing. What do you do with it? The answer is you can use it to control the upper screen. Take a look. As I move my finger, you can see exactly how I'm moving, translating to the upper screen. So if you do not want to lift your hand all the way to the upper screen, then you can simply control it using the lower screen. This is, I think, a first. You have a screen 
machine that controls a screen, and these two screens are only about eight inches away from each other. It seems ridiculously redundant, but it's there as a supplementary control to the upper screen. And just to be clear, I say it's a supplementary control because, again, the upper screen is a touchscreen. You could just go up there and touch stuff, or you could control it using your lower screen. <laughs> really unusual, but that's what they've done. And one other interesting item on that lower screen, in the bottom left of the screen, you have the camera button. If you press that, it pulls up the camera system in this car, and one of the options is a 360 degree exterior camera. So it basically shows your car and then it shows everything happening around it. Like there's some sort of camera helicopter hovering around your car. It's a really, really good system. You can see it from various different angles and I really like it. I will say this system is not quite as good as some rivals. You can see there's some duplicating of the image, which leads to you not quite being sure exactly if you're about to hit something. BMW does it a little better, but still this is a great feature and I'm glad Porsche has included it. And next up, we move on to that center screen, which has far more controls than that lower screen. If you go to the home menu on the center screen, you see the typical stuff, navigation, media, settings, basically what you would have in a regular Porsche infotainment system. But there are quite a few unusual and new items in here, and I'm going to start with the climate vents. Now, if you look at the climate vents in the middle, you can see you can't adjust them, and there's no way to stop airflow, which is kind of strange, but sometimes that happens with middle climate vents. But even over on the sides, there's nowhere to move them. You pull on them, you move around, there's nothing there that can move the vents. So how do you change the positioning and the airflow in the climate vents? Well, you go into the climate tab in the infotainment screen, and you can see there are a few options. You have diffused, focused and individual. Diffused will kind of blow air throughout the cabin. Focused will move the climate vents and focus them on you. But my favorite is individual because you get to set the positioning of the climate vents using the center screen. You just kind of move around these little bubbles and you can place the climate vents wherever you want. And then the vents will actually move to blow air to wherever you set them. I can feel the collective eye roll from people who just want a simple little lever on the vents themselves. But I guess this is how Porsche will be addressing climate vent adjustments in the future. It's also worth noting that you can adjust the airflow to the climate vents with this little bar that pops up over on the left. It's like a slider and you can move it up or down for more or less airflow. Same deal over on the passenger side. You can choose between diffused, focused, and individual. And once again, you kind of move the bubbles around for individual and you can position the climate vents exactly where you want. So no more simply moving the vents on the vent themselves you gotta go into the screen. Now, next up, we move on to some interesting car settings. The first one that caught my eye was something called electric sport sound, which you can turn on or off. What does that do? I'm not really sure. I'm gonna try it out when I drive and I'll see if I can tell the difference between sport and normal, whatever. <laughs> And next up, another interesting item in car settings is recuperation, which you can set to use some of the car's momentum when it's slowing down to convert back into energy and give you more miles of charge. You can set this to off, on, or auto. Now, you may be wondering why someone would turn this off. Isn't it better to have more range? But it does change the characteristic of the car slowing down, apparently. So if you want a more natural driving feel, you turn that off, and then it'll feel more like driving a normal car. And and that's why Porsche allows it to be configurable. And next up, moving on to the navigation system in this screen. Pretty standard Porsche navigation system, but there are some unusual new items. One is range. You can select a menu item called range, and then if you zoom out, you can see it shows exactly how far you can go on your current charge. It shows your current range. That is a pretty cool feature, and I like to see when electric cars include stuff like that in their navigation systems. It just makes things a little bit more convenient and easy to figure out how far you can drive. The other interesting new item with the navigation system is how you enter a destination. You go to search, which allows you to type in an address or city, whatever, and then you can actually hand write it using that empty spot on the lower screen. So you can write in whatever you want. The car will pick up your writing most of the time, and then it will pull up on the screen. You can select it, and that's your destination. Far easier than typing each individual letter out on a touchscreen. Writing it is always a better solution. And next up, we move on to 
to the third screen, and that would be the gauge cluster screen, which is a very unusually shaped screen. It's shaped like a gauge cluster, not like a rectangle or a square like most other screens. The most interesting part of this gauge cluster screen to me, though, is it's partially a touch screen. You'll notice over to the left you have various different levels of lighting. You can tap them and it turns on the parking lights or the automatic lights or whatever you want to do. There's no physical light control over on the left, like in most other cars. Same deal on the right side of this weirdly shaped gauge cluster screen. You have various different buttons to control different car functions. You can turn off traction control. You have the shortcut button, which is the diamond that you can program to be anything, and you can tap those. So your gauge cluster screen is a touch screen. Now, I should mention that the gauge cluster is not a touch screen in the middle. It is very configurable, but if you want to configure it, you have to press this little button on the steering wheel to kind of move between the different parts of the gauge cluster. And then you can use this little wheel on the steering wheel to scroll through various different options. The most important one is in the middle. You can see right now it's on map and it's showing a map of where I am. You can also set it to an enlarged map and then it basically takes over the entire gauge cluster screen, which is a nice look and can be very useful. You can also set it to power meter and then it will show how much power you're using as you drive around with your speedometer right in the middle and you can set it to reduced. If all that stuff is just too complex for you, put on reduced and you have a very simple gauge cluster screen, not all sorts of different items coming at you at once. But over to the left and right of that center part of the screen, you can configure various different items too. Once again, just use that steering wheel button to move to whichever part you want. And then you can kind of use the wheel to scroll through various different items. And it's all sorts of different car functions. You can look at your safety systems, your tire pressures, your trip odometer, your phone, your media that's currently playing, all sorts of different stuff. So you have a nice configurable gauge cluster that allows you to choose whatever you want to see which is a good departure from fixed gauges where that's all you're looking at. And next up, another notable item is the gauge cluster graphic that appears when you turn off the Taycan. Check this out. You turn it off and it says Taycan and shows a silhouette of the car. Pretty standard. A lot of cars do that. But then the car silhouette turns and you kind of see the light bar from behind and then the light bar slowly fades away and then the car is off. A lot of cars now have start up and turn off graphics, but that is one of the coolest ones I've seen. And next up, we move on to the steering wheel, which is pretty much the same steering wheel you'll find in most other Porsche models. Although notably it lacks paddles because this car lacks a traditional transmission. The one interesting item worth noting on the steering wheel is this little dial that comes off to the right. That's your drive mode adjuster dial. You can twist it and then you can see in the gauge cluster your various drive modes appear and you can kind of scroll through all of them and pick which one you want. A new one for this car is something called range, which I assume will do everything possible to maximize your range and efficiency and allow you to travel as far as possible on one single charge. And finally, I want to talk about interior quality, which is fantastic. Everything feels absolutely wonderful, stitched well, put together well, top-notch materials all over this interior, far eclipsing what you get in Tesla. This is a really good luxury car interior. With that said, I'm a little disappointed about one aspect, and that would be this little plastic panel on this pillar next to the door panel. You can see the door panel is beautiful, different colors, stitching, carbon fiber, and then it runs into this plastic panel and it just doesn't look anywhere near as good. For $185,000, you would think that panel would be finished in something other than what looks like cheap plastic. And next up, we move on to the back seat of the Taycan. And the first thing you notice back here is that it's sporty. There's no three-person bench seat back here. Instead, you have two individual bucket seats, and they are quite heavily bolstered. I guess the theory here is you can take your whole family on the track, and they won't slosh around in their seats. It is worth noting that optional in this car is a three-person rear bench, so you can have a five-seater car or 
you can have a four seater like this one if you don't plan to take five people very often. Now, aside from the bucket seats, the first thing you notice when you get back here is the roof, which is a massive glass panel. This piece doesn't open, it's fixed in place, and there's no cover for it, although it's tinted, so not much sunlight gets through, but still it is a huge piece of glass, and it really makes the rear feel very open. Now, this piece covers the front seats too, but you don't quite notice it as much in front, but back here, it feels like you're in some sort of tour bus or glass bottom boat, except it's on the top. And speaking of windows, another item worth noting back here, due to this car's design, the rear windows don't open very far. You roll down the windows and this is as far as they open. Contrary to popular myth, this is not a safety thing to keep your kids from climbing out. It's based on the design of the back door. And in this case, the window just can't go very far into the door. With that said, there is some good news for rear seat passengers. There are a few nice features back here. For example, you have heated seats in back. You can press these little buttons, turn on the heated seats to three different stages. And you also have individual reading lights back here. You have a little button on the seat you can push it and that turns on the reading lights so you can read while you're being whisked around on the racetrack in your electric Porsche. One other thing the rear seat passengers have, climate control adjusters on the vents themselves. They have a little dial to regulate airflow and these little switches to move around the vents. So if you don't want to deal with that center screen for your climate vent adjusting, just sit in the back. And next up, we move around to the back of the Taycan and onto the trunk. I'm gonna start with opening the trunk, which you do with this rather obvious button in the center of the rear of the car. Most automakers put their trunk opener button like right above the license plate, but I guess Porsche thought that would be too far for people to bend down. So instead, it's right here and it is pretty in your face as far as trunk buttons go. But anyway, you press it and then the trunk pops open, revealing a rather small trunk. This is not a hatchback like the Panamera where the rear cargo area is open to the cabin. Instead, this car has a true trunk or boot, if you want to call it that, like a traditional sedan, and it isn't really all that huge. Although it's worth noting that you can pull on this little loop and then there's a little bit more storage under here in case you have tiny items you want to keep out of the rest of the trunk. And next up, another notable item in the trunk is the emergency exit. Now the government mandates that all cars with a cargo area have to include some sort of emergency exit release so that if you get kidnapped and stuffed in a trunk, you can get out. Most cars have like an ugly little lever that hangs down, but this car has a nice little button that says exit in a very calm way. Porsche even does the emergency exit trunk release nicer than other automakers. And next up, moving on to the back of the Taycan, where there are a couple more noteworthy items, one of which is right above the license plate. You can see you have your rear camera. That's not interesting. In fact, it's mandated. But right next to the camera, there's this little thing that sticks out. So what exactly is that? That's a washer. And if the camera gets dirty, you can go into the infotainment system, into the camera, press this little washer looking button, and then it actually washes the camera. So you don't have to get out and wash the camera yourself. The car will do that for you, which is a pretty nice little quirk. Now, another interesting washing related item with the Taycan comes with the rear spoiler. In other Porsche models, you can drive around with the rear spoiler up so people stare at you. Not so in the Taycan. There's a spoiler right here and it will automatically go up at certain speeds, but you can only manually put it up to wash the car. There's a little item in the infotainment system that allows you to put the spoiler in cleaning mode. It only goes up this far, so you can basically get a rag underneath it and clean the area. That's it. You can't actually drive with the spoiler up, so you can't have people staring at you and you're cool Porsche with the spoiler. And next up, another cool item on the back of this car. All Porsche models have light bars now. That's not particularly noteworthy. What's neat is right below that, the Porsche script is in what looks like a circuit. You can see all these little lines kind of going between each letter, and it looks sort of futuristic and special and high tech. And I really like that they bothered to do that gives the car just a slightly more interesting look. Now, the last thing I want to discuss back here is this car's name, because it's caused quite a bit of controversy. I'm going to start with Taycan. And yes, that is how you say it, Taycan and not Taycan, which is odd because 
It looks like it would be pronounced Taycan, but Porsche assures me that it isn't. It's also strange because they have a car called the Macan, which isn't related to this. So you have Macan and Taycan, not Taycan, two separate Porsche models. I find that to be weird. But I also want to talk about the other name on the back of this car, and that would be Turbo S. When Porsche announced that they would be using Turbo and Turbo S for the highest performance versions of this car, people flipped out. The internet absolutely lost it. How can they call it the Turbo? It doesn't even have a gas engine or a turbo. It's sacrilege. People. <laughs> How can you take car names this literally? Looking around this parking lot, do you think the Chevy Trailblazer is out there blazing trails? Do you think the Toyota Highlander is in the Highlands? No, it's sitting in a parking lot in suburban LA next to a Prius. The Chevy Avalanche, the closest it's ever gonna come to an actual avalanche, is when the owner stops at Dairy Queen for a blizzard. The simple truth is, in today's world of electrification and smaller turbo engines, none of these names mean anything anymore. The BMW 550i no longer has a five liter V8. The Mercedes C43 doesn't have a 4.3 liter engine, and this does not have a turbo. But in Porsche world now, turbo just means fast. Quit clutching your pearls and get used to it. Join 2020. This is how it's going to be. And finally, our last item around the back of this car. This is a sporty Porsche, and so let's do the same thing I do every time I review a Porsche performance car. Let's take a listen to that exhaust note. Here you go. Anyway, next I want to move on to the front trunk, and there are two ways to open the front trunk. One I showed you earlier, you can use the screen, or you can just press a little button on the key fob. You do that, the trunk pops open to here, then there's a little latch you get under, and then you can open it right up. Pretty simple. Interestingly, it's kind of small. For a car that has this much frontal space, not much of it is actually usable front trunk storage space, but it's there and it's nice to have two different trunks, especially since the rear one is also relatively small. That makes this car more practical. And finally, we move on to this car's styling. And I have to say, I like it, as do most people from what I gather. It's a nice look, very slippery aerodynamic, still preserves the look of a Porsche. It's a really good looking car and it certainly looks better than basically every other electric car on the market today, yes, including Tesla. One thing I will say is I wish Porsche had started an electric car with a sports car, since that would be more true to the Porsche ethos, but sports cars don't really get a lot of sales these days. That probably would have been a mistake from a business perspective but from a car enthusiast perspective, I think it would have been cool. One other item worth noting on the outside of this car is these wheels. Porsche calls these the Mission E wheels because they're supposed to mimic the ones that were on the original Mission E concept. And frankly, I have to say, they did a pretty good job. Here's the Mission E concept. You can see how it looks and then how this car looks also. Obviously, it's surprising when an automaker gets that close from a concept car to reality, but they've done it here. And so, if you liked the Mission E when it came out as a concept car and got a lot of attention, then almost undoubtedly you will also like the Taycan. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2020 Porsche Taycan Turbo S. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Taycan. I'm gonna start by just punching. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I have to say, flooring it, after it gets going, it feels about like a really fast gas car. But that first burst, <sighs> that's about the craziest flooring it I've ever <sighs> You're hanging on for dear life. Oh my God. It's so fast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow. Oh my God, that's, that's crazy. I can't believe I've just experienced that. 
One of the first things that I notice when I drive this car is the quality uh, difference between Tesla and, and Porsche. Um, you know, I, I have to say, one thing I was very surprised about was when Porsche came out with the pricing for this car, I, it was another thing, the internet lost its mind. How is it so expensive? You know, Tesla Model S is this much cheaper? First off, Porsche has never been cheaper than anything. I mean, if you look at 911, if you look at Cayenne X3 versus Macan, Porsche's always more expensive. The theory is it's because Porsche is better. Uh, it doesn't take much to get better than Tesla's interior quality. Tesla provides an excellent vehicle uh, in terms of value. They're able to pack an enormous amount of range and tech into a car that's not that expensive compared to its rivals. What Tesla doesn't offer is the ability to do track lap after track lap without overheating, the ability to have a really, really top quality upscale interior. And so the result of that is that, yeah, this car is more expensive. The theory though is that it's also better. Um, and just in a second of getting in here and looking around, you can tell the quality is an obvious improvement. I will say steering too is clearly really top notch. Um, Tesla's steer great. They have a really uh, tight ratio. They steer real quick. Um, but one thing that this car does that like the Model 3 Performance I recently drove doesn't do all that well, um, incredibly planted and flat and stable and you don't really feel much. When you're going around corners, this feels like a 911, like a sports car uh, to a degree that basically few other electric vehicles do. Oh my God, it's so fast. Oh, I can't believe how fast this car is. <laughs> but I will say I've been driving for four minutes and I have gone through 20 miles of range. So as exciting as it is to just drop the throttle and go, um, I, I, I truly wonder, I probably, maybe you can get an hour of driving like that. Uh, that's not the intended efficiency mode, if that's what you want to do. Yeah, the steering is just fantastic. The car, because it's so low and so wide, set perfectly for cornering. It's not just that the steering is good, the car also handles tremendously well. Mid-corner, coming out of the corners, it feels like a Porsche sports car. It feels like a 911. To me, it feels quicker and sportier than the Panamera. Um, which I think feels, I've always felt, feels like a bigger kind of boat type car. This doesn't feel like that. And now I want to try the electric sport sound. Oh, there. <laughs> I hope you can hear that on the camera. There's like a futuristic type sound. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now I'm just sort of cruising around a, sort of a standard residential neighborhood, um, you know, because most of the time people aren't gonna be flooring it and going hard through corners in this car. It really does behave like a nice luxury gas car with the exception of you don't really hear anything. Um, it, it just is, is fantastic and it drives well and it looks good and it looks good in here. And um, this is a really, really quite an impressive car. To me, this is how Porsche makes an electric car. It drives like a Porsche. It's fast, it's fun, it's exciting. <laughs> it's very, very enjoyable to drive. And so that's the 2020 Porsche Taycan Turbo S. This is a fantastic car, but Porsche is playing catch up. They don't have the charging infrastructure that Tesla does. They don't have the range that Tesla does. And this car is vastly more expensive than Tesla's vehicles. But this car is much higher quality than a Tesla. The performance is insane. The brand name is fantastic. And this is the first car that has really equaled Tesla in hype. And the hype is worth it. Anyway, now it's time to give the Taycan Turbo S a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Taycan Turbo S is nice looking, though a bit controversial and not exactly classically beautiful, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration is insane, as you could see, it does 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds, which easily earns it a 10 out of 10. Handling is sharp, though not quite as sharp as my very favorite four-door cars, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is huge, given the acceleration and the handling, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is huge right now, and it easily earns an 8 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 39 out of 50. Next 
Next up are the daily categories and features. The Tycon has a lot of great tech, but it's not quite the best, and it earns an 8 out of 10. Comfort is normal for the class, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is very high, and it earns an 8 out of 10. Practicality is average due to the four seats and small trunks, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, value, and this car is really impressive, but it's also really pricey. $185,000 is just insane money, and that's before options. It's so expensive, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total daily score of 33 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 72 out of 100, which places it here against other high-performance sedans and electric vehicles. Amazingly, the Taycan Turbo S ties the car I think is its closest competitor. The Mercedes AMG GT sedan both get 72, but the AMG GT does better in daily categories thanks to better tech and more reasonable pricing, while the Taycan does better in weekend scores. Overall, the Taycan is really impressive but it's also really expensive. If you want the charge port to close, just slide your fingers back under the sensor, and indeed, the charge port will eventually... <laughs>